Welcome. I'm gonna leave this meeting to the Lovecraft Using podcast. Pete was just explaining how he's getting drunk right now. It's just, I swear to God, it's just water. Okay, Bridget's but getting drunk right now. Vodka looks it's just like ginger water. beer. Ginger oh, beer, what's it like? Oh, really? What's it like? One percent? No, not even that. <laughs> I'm so disappointed I was at, in both of it's you. It's gonna take a while. <laughs> I was so the ginger beer I get at Costco is never give up, Bridget. Five percent. Mm-hmm. But the um, I was at a brewery the other night in downtown West Palm Beach, and they had eight percent ginger beer. Oh wow, that's like the and, real legit stuff, yeah. And like one, you know, like one pint put me on my ass. Oh my gosh! So uh, who, wants, who wants to get drunk drinking? You do, and one pint put you on your ass. I am a I look. I love to drink, and I drink a lot. But everybody will tell you, I'm a lightweight. Well, I'm Mike Davis. Good to meet you, lightweight. No guests today. Josh Bellerman will be here next week. Uh, I'm. Well, I won't bore you with the reasons why, but we'll just say it's all my fault because that's true. Uh, no, he graciously um rescheduled because I'm kind of in a flare up. So Pete, yes, you are not drinking alcohol. No. Bridget, I you are drinking alcohol tonight. Okay. What are you doing tonight? Uh it's Sunday night family and friends dinner. Okay. So and were we invited? Did anyone get an uh, you guys are always invited if you can get here. Okay. Um I've told you this before. One of these days, we're going to take you up on that, Pete. Yeah. Without telling him. Take that would drive be great. Show up. Yeah, we should coordinate. Do it sometime when he's not expecting us. 6.30 on Sundays. You've sent me enough books so I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to dox Pete while we're at it. Anybody who's a listener of the podcast who wants a good meal, just go to this address. <laughs> Ellen Ripley is on the show today. Hey, Ellen. Hello. How are you? Ellen, coolest morning officer out there, aka Bridget. That's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. For those who can't see, uh, Bridget's wearing an Ellen Ripley uniform. It's cool. It's a jumpsuit. Yeah. She's wearing a jumpsuit. <laughs> it is. It's overalls that I made it. She's a fireman. He's just a <laughs> fireman. <laughs> I just need the orange cat to come in here to complete the look. Where's Daniel? Yeah, well, if for those of you who cannot see um, Bridget's outfit, you should you should check it out. It's really cool looking. And what I'm doing from yesterday, not yesterday, but last week on in the audio podcasts, the first link is always to going to be to the YouTube, just in case you feel like watching it instead of listening to it that week. I know some people always listen to it, some people always watch it, and some go back and forth depending on if they're on the road or not. So, do you guys feel like you're sufficiently introduced? Should we go move to Matt? You just glossed over Matt. Oh, you're... yeah. Well, we can gloss over him if you want. I mean, I wasn't going no. to, but if that's what you want to do, never. No. Wait, he's Matt's got a prize. Exactly a glossary. So. Okay, so two things. First of all, we do have a prize this week. It is the, I think, either Eisner nominated or winning uh, graphic novel volume one of Philadelphia. Uh, it's a vampire novel set in Philadelphia, and the art is just great. Uh, you could potentially win this if you send an email to easyandprizes at gmail.com. Put Philadelphia in the subject heading. We'll draw a winner. Usually it's in about six weeks or so. So you got plenty of time to get in your entry, but no chance if you don't enter. Now, the other yeah, thing win if you don't play. I uh, do Lovecraft DC movie night. We were going to watch the Spider Labyrinth. I'd advertised it, but for some reason that is no longer streaming where it was a few weeks ago. So these things just go in and out of contract. We got to wait. It's just like that. Uh, what is it? Five million years to Earth, that quarter main movie. I, I can't show yet, but we ended up watching a folk horror movie from Malaysia called Ro, R-O-H. I, I think it means souls or something like that. Okay. And um, it's like the first Malaysian movie I think I've seen maybe. It's, it was folk, uh, a folk story, folk horror, and 
if you watched the long walk from Laos, you you know folk uh, lore from that area of the world, it can be just brutal. And so this is not, it is, it's, it's absorbing, it's interesting, but uh, no happy ending, man. Yeah, the long walk was really great as well. I enjoyed that. So I, I'm always looking for good folk horror or cosmic horror movies from other uh, cultures. So if you can think of any, just let me know and I'll put them on my list. So would you recommend Ro, ROH? Yeah, it is not. It's a little movie. Okay. It only lasts an hour and 20 minutes. Um, it's got what, maybe four, six actors in the whole thing. There's essentially one set. Um, and uh, it is all just, for me, it's all just very um, alien. It, I don't mean that in any kind of bad way. It's just so different than my experience, the way that they're living in this isolated, uh, essentially a hut in the middle of the jungle in Malaysia yeah. with essentially no neighbors. And they're, they're, they're struggling. They're poor. They don't have anything. Uh, but if you don't, even if you don't have anything, something can be taken away. Um, I, I think it's it's hard to say because it wasn't like I said, "Ooh, that's that's great." It was just so absorbing because maybe it was the cultural stuff. But also, well, if, it, if if a movie is absorbing, I I would say it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah. It, so I just I really would be interested in other opinions if anyone else saw it. Um, I I enjoyed it um but i i, I also wonder if it's the reason i enjoyed it so much because it was from malaysia you know what i mean yeah what did the other viewers think last night well we were all kind of like uh, well that was very cheerful <laughs> <laughs> bridget you're bring, you're drinking ginger beer yes it has probably less alcohol than kombucha is there a point or is there is it just the taste or is it the point to get no, drunk very slowly? No, I just like the taste <laughs> ginger beer. Doesn't it just taste like old ginger ale? Yeah, it's okay. good, but it has a little more bite to it. That's all. Is it what's what's the brand? Is it Biterbung or um oh gosh, of course you'd ask me that. I don't know. Never mind. Forget <laughs> it. Just forget it. Well, I didn't know this was going to be a connoisseur kind of. <laughs> yes, I'd rather have a, as Tom Waits said, a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Yeah. yeah maybe. No, this is more of like a mixer thing if you're going to go that route. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. So we're talking about movies. We are. I, I mean, yes. Yes, have some. Um, I'm going to recommend come play. I think it's on uh, Paramount Plus. Can you give a synopsis? It is on Prime Video. Was it Prime? Free. It's it's a about a, an autistic child who um, makes contact with another entity on a laptop. Um, you know, one of these uh, uh, apps that highlights faces. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it is, there, is it really good? Was it? I you know put it on as background noise, you know, because I like to watch TV while I do something else, and I ended up putting everything else away and watching it. Ooh. It's not as good as Z. I loved Z. And Z was really good. Um, and then there was that other one. Um, yeah, we watched. I'll watch something else at the same time, and I never can remember what it is. Yeah, um, is that the Daniel is it? real yes yes daniel isn't yes. real um I, Dan, of, of the three movies i think daniel isn't real z and z are better but i like um come play just as much daniel isn't real um of of that one and z i liked z better although i would Rewatch Daniel isn't real, and the book was interesting as well. Yeah, it had a different title. I can't remember what the title was. Yeah, I have it downstairs. I don't remember what it is. Was it Adam something? I don't know. Yeah, 
And the other thing that I just finished watching yesterday was the first season of The Last of Us. Mm. I hope everyone has their pen really and paper ready for all this. Yeah. And like, I enjoyed it, but I'm not so sure it was all that. I couldn't make it through the season. It's sort of. But I would say that the third episode was one of the best hours of TV. I think it was the third that I've ever seen. About the two okay. guys who meet. Yeah. Okay. So I think that episode alone is great. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a standalone even. It could be yeah. a standalone. And and note that there's nothing. There's there's only one scene with with the infected in that whole whole episode. Um, so you could make that, and this might be my complaint, is that the vast majority of the films have absolutely little to do with the actual um, monsters. It's 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 zombies. We we can spoil it. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's fungus. They're zombies. not zombies. They're fungi mo fungi monsters. They're fungi yeah. zombies. Well, but um, <laughs> that's, that's just and, and when they gifts. yeah, I. They're, it's a little different than the girl with all the gifts, um, but um, I think the problem I have with it is is that when when they do show up, they're kind of used as Deus Ex Machina, like they get the characters out of trouble a couple times, it's like because they, you know, there's uh, you know, what's the apocalypse? Humans versus humans is the real issue here, yeah. but every you know, it's like everyone's about to be shot and killed because there's no other no other way out, and then all of a sudden. The whole place is swarming with, you know, fungus zombies, mm -hmm. and everyone you know is is saved from their conflict. Yeah, kind of. But ultimately, this is really about people against people. It's and one of those shows that everyone seems crazy about, but I, yeah. I didn't last past the fourth episode. I don't think, and the same with. Uh, quiet place i didn't really enjoy the first movie and i haven't seen the second one and, and i guess the other thing i'll say is that like you know post-apocalyptic america in the last of us kind of looks like the back roads of america today I, I didn't see much difference so you know i enjoyed it but i didn't play the video game and i know that people that played the video game got a lot more out of the show i think um because it was more about the nostalgia and and just yeah. seeing it play out in a in a film you know tv show format i think but i, I, I still enjoyed it but i like zombie genre so. the interesting thing about that is logan loved loves the game he did not watch the show with me but like he was in the living room a couple times and he was watching the main the, the guy, forget his name. Pedro uh, Pascal. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. just something like, I don't like this. But he he seems like an asshole and he was not an asshole in the game. Is what oh, yeah. He, he's a total asshole in the in the in the movie. Yeah. Um, but that's part of the character for for the film for the, the show. Um yeah. I don't want people to get me wrong. I like the 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 series. I think it was a well produced, well directed, well acted series. It just didn't do it. I don't think it broke any new ground. Um, I would watch I agree. it again, but you know, it's it's something that we've seen before, and you know, there was one of the things that I and Matt brought it up. One of the things I liked about the girl with all the gifts is the is the ecology and evolution of the monsters. We we got to see a lot of that. We didn't see much of that in this series at all. But we saw like a ginormous shroom monster. Yes. That was actually really cool. They'd never put anything like that on screen. Uh, Matango. Watch Matango, Attack of the Mushroom People. Oh. Yeah, but that's not the same as like this particular prosthetic. Like that kind of thing had never been done. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting that, that you guys brought up post-apocalyptic horror. Um because I was actually going to bring up an author I've discovered, and I'm sure I'm, I'm really late with this, but that's okay. Uh, Emily St. John Mandel, 
Uh, there's a series that I have not watched yet that I'm going to watch called Station Eleven. Post-apocalyptic. My office is right. I can't say that word correctly. I've heard of that. I've I've watched it. Um, what did you think, Pete? I thought it was a very what's the one I'm looking for. Uh, it it's a really great attempt to make a literary post-apocalyptic film or or series, and I, I think they accomplished it. It's really mm. quite um. No kidding. Okay. Imaginative. Um, so I'm interested in that, and then I'm interested in her books. Uh, yeah, I think they're graphic novels. No. No. Okay. No, they're novels. Um, she's got. Here's an article on Vox uh, from a couple years ago. Station Eleven made me want to live in the post-apocalypse. So, you know, there's that. Um. Does it? Does it really? No. Like, that's such a weird thing to say. Like, yeah. Yeah, I haven't read the article, but. Um, All right. So here's a. One of the, yeah. One of the premises of Station Eleven, if I'm remembering correctly. Don't spoil anything for no, me. No, no, no. Is that some of the main characters are part of a traveling Shakespearean company? Hmm. Uh, going through uh, upper Midwest uh, North America. Interesting. Um, and, you know, that is, that's a, a plot point that is key to the whole thing. And they view, they don't particularly view themselves as caretakers for culture, but, but that's what they are. You know, no, no matter how long you've been reading, if, if you really, huh? What? Art as a caretaker of culture? No, you don't. Yes. Really, not tell me how that made you feel. Mm -hmm. um, and no, no matter how long you've been reading, if you're a person who really, 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 really loves to read and, you know, you view it as an exploration of, of, of minds, of experiences, of stories, there's a great feeling when you discover a new writer or a new series mm -hmm. that you, it just fills you with, at least me, it fills you with this joy. Uh, and I had that experience last night when I was doing a Google search. For some reason, I was in the mood for, for this kind of fiction, post-apocalypse fiction. And apparently, at least one of her books are because she came up. And here's a, excuse me, Here's an article from Pan Macmillan. And the first paragraph is, you can't pin a genre on Emily St. John Mandel. By the way, that's just how it sounds. I'll link to her at Amazon in the show notes. Emily St. John, M-A-N-D-E-L. Uh, Mike, what I, think you, be, yes. I think it might be pronounced Sinjin. Sinjin? Yeah. What are you talking about? St. John, I think, is generally pronounced Sinjin. Is it really? Yeah. Learn something new every day. Uh, well, that's definitely not Wait a second. how it I sounds. Think, uh, the only St. John I knew was like some actress in the 80s, right? What you can be certain of, though, is the virtuosity of her writing. The best-selling author of six novels, her breakout success was Station Eleven which was followed by The Glass Hotel, selected by President Barack Obama as one of his favorite books of 2020, and her most recent, Sea of Tranquility. All very different, they can be enjoyed as standalone novels and are also in brilliant, intriguing conversation with each other. Here you will find prose as precise and clear as glass, intricate, meticulous plotting, and an underlying feeling of otherworldliness. See, we're still talking about weird fiction. With characters living in strange, living strange twilight lives. So I'm I'm excited. I started reading Sea of Tranquility last night. And so I mean I didn't even know and I didn't even know that Obama had recommended that book. So 
Yeah, so I'm nine years nine years behind the curve on this one, but that's okay. Well, we can't talk about post-apocalyptic stuff without, like, I was talking about Silo last week, and right. Right. I finished the book Wool this week and immediately had to start the next book, and I'm a third of the way into Shift, which is the second book, and it's kind of a, well, mostly a prequel in the same universe, and it goes back into more describing, you know, how the calamity happened. And I have to say, it's even more profound than the first book. Like, it's is this the second book or the third one? Second book. Okay. And this is the Hugh Halley stuff that he had to publish mm -hmm. on his own. Yeah. Self published. That he had to work. It's so good. It's but it's crazy to me because the first book, Wool, came out in 2011. So just thinking about the stuff that he was affected by to write the story to begin with is just some of the, the technology that had been created, you know, in the the late 2009, 2010, um, some stuff that you could tell inspired him to think about some things. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild. I can't tell any spoilers, but. Well, you, it's so I'm, I've started wool also, by the way, I, th I think this is still true. The first two books are $1.99 on Kindle right now. So, right. and, and by the way, somebody, I bought it for $1.99 last week after your recommendation Bridget and then like a day or two later somebody gifted me the book but on Amazon but there's no name attached to it so I'd like to thank the person first of all but I can't accept it because I've already got the book I don't know how that works but I want to give them their 199 back <laughs> oh. anyway whoever did it that was very nice of you but yeah I've got to finish I started Wool as well. I got a bad habit of reading like three or four books at a time. Okay. And yeah, but you said the sentence that what you said last week that really got me to to purchase purchase this book was that you said uh, it changed you. Yeah, and I feel like the second book is it even more. Oh wow! Changing me. It's crazy. Uh, I can't wait until you finish reading it so I can talk about okay. it. <laughs> Well, I'll go through that, and then I'll get back to to uh, Emily's. What'd you say, Shazan? Shazan? Shazan from from Angel? <laughs> Philistine. I'm not pronouncing Saint John correctly. So, anyway, yeah. So I hope everybody's been writing all these down. Unless you're, unless you're in the car, then don't don't write them down. Wasn't that actress in the seventies named Jill St. John? I mean, it wasn't she wasn't Sun Jun. Yes, I, I understand that. So, I think... and you know, it's not St. Jun the Baptist. This is oh, my fascinating word. conversation, this is really. Watch this. Good. Uh, my head's just gonna explode. I'm just gonna <laughs> forget I ever said anything. John okay. Yeah, I, you didn't even have to tell me to do that. I was already gonna do it. <laughs> All right, so a couple of ways for the listeners, you can stay in the loop about what's going on um, with the, the podcast. If you want to. If you want to, <laughs> yes, exactly right. Thank you. That was Why a fly you? ball, and you that, that, was, that was a low fly ball, and you should be ashamed that you swung at that. Why? Matthew. Why? I, we knocked it out of the park. If I, don't, <laughs> if I don't have any shame, Mike, it doesn't help. How dare you, sir? <laughs> well, I um, said good day. Good day. <laughs> Call me, sir. God damn it. Um, anyway, so you can stay through, so stay in the loop through social media, such as that is these days. Lovecraft mm -hmm. Easy and on Patreon. I mean, X. Um, just like it sounds. Lovecraft Ezine. Uh, Ezine. Ezine. That's an E. Yeah. Plus me. Yeah. Um, pronounced easy cheese yes it is a lot of people at the beginning pronounce the e sign I'm, I'm like it's short for electronic magazine <laughs> so that would be seen um yeah. <laughs> wait i gotta issue oh up. he's flipping that off again he's flipping us all off let's oh, be real okay 
Uh, social media. I'm on Facebook. You can just yeah, whatever. Is there anything but Facebook left? I mean, I, not so much. Yeah, I said the same thing to a friend, and like I tell you, God, I I would have taken my forty four billion dollars or whatever the hell it was. It made myself a mansion out of nickels. I would have done something different. Better use of the money. Yeah, he's Twitter's burning to the ground, and. I don't know. Facebook, you know, the Look, Blue Sky and Threads, they've got great potential, but the problem is people have tried them and they drop, they both drop the ball. I mean, it's nothing but crickets at both of them. Look, so. just, be, just because your manic goth pixie girl girlfriend baby mama dumped you doesn't mean, the and you're a billionaire, doesn't mean the rest of us have to suffer. And we are. Find a better, more creative way to channel your angst. Well, you can also you're stay. Like, in... You're slamming him on Zoom. AI is going <laughs> to hear you. <laughs> yeah, I might. Problem... I might have to use a different platform if Zoom's going to continue this. The problem is, Bridget. He actually listens to this shit and takes it personally. Yeah, it's crazy. Just... he's a nutter. He's crazy. Um. Facebook Messenger, right? we've got a Facebook Messenger chat thread that you can join, and it is very low traffic. I mean, you can pop back out of there anytime, but I always include, you know, I do, it's basically a once a week thing with few exceptions. Um, so those are the way you, so you can keep track of the show. Just wanted to point those out. And those all those links are in the show notes. All right. So what else are we going to talk about? Well, what, what, why we're still on this subject? Is it possible that the whole point of taking over Twitter and then slowly destroying basically all all other social medias was Facebook's plan all along? Facebook. Yeah. You mean Musk? I mean, yeah. No. No. But you know. But are you saying that Musk that, is secretly dating? Uh, yeah. The only the, people the who founder are benefiting yeah. from what's well, going on anymore. Yeah, Zuckerberg. Yeah. The only people that seem to benefit from everything that's going on has been Facebook because even as everything else fails, the Facebook's going down the tubes as well. Pro, you know, Not as quick. I wouldn't say that. So, but here's, here's the problem. Zucker created threads and millions of people joined and they're like, nothing's going on here. So they don't. No, nobody's signing in. Right. Well, but I'm that's... saying that like Facebook has been having severe service issues lately, mm -hmm. but still it's better than anything else that's out there. Right. Well, because Facebook, you have to approve friends. Like that's the huge difference. Like you can limit your network, but the downside is that instead of like sharing with your family and friends, like, Hey, here's something that I did. And like that just kind of organic networking that happens now it's Facebook's going to bury your ads or like anything that you try to post that is perceived as promotion and not like, you know, sharing stuff with your friends and family, it uh -huh. buries it. It doesn't show it to people because they want you to buy ads. And so just, mm -hmm. you can't even use that to like, you know, just network or like share things amongst friends or, you know, self-promotion is super frowned upon. But then you go to those other sites and it's like, you're just dropping a fish into a huge ocean. So yeah. you're posting, posting to the nether to maybe a few people that care. <laughs> like A lot of people are, I mean, not seeing my tweets as much as they used to. And I'm this close to just you know, saying, screw it and delete the account. Is it, are you still tweeting or are you what's the if you're I not have no or, idea i think he calls it posting now oh lord because no, yeah Does it? <laughs> yeah but really? i've noticed like there, i mean our instagram is such an art heavy platform and i've known a lot of artists too that have had huge followings and then all of a sudden you know the algorithm changes and nobody sees their posts anymore right yeah well, there, there, another another thing that's going on is Substack, and it's got a social media element to it as well. Um, and I really, really like it so far. I think the social media aspect of it 
needs some refinement, but it's it's kind of the cross a cross between a blogging, uh, you know, a blog and a social media. Um, I'm on there now, and uh, I've got the link in the show notes. So I hope everybody checks it out. Um, talking about horror and so forth, but I'm also talking about a few other things that I won't bore people with on the show. But but there's been a lot of response so far. So Substack is a possibility for people. Feel free to bore us with whatever. Uh, well, honestly, one of the things I'm talking <laughs> about is this, and I know I will bore you. Uh, as you guys know, I, I grew up in a cult un unwillingly. And when I got out at age 18, when I left, it was like I had been on another planet my whole life. Yeah. And so I really didn't know much of anything. I didn't understand anything. And I was hugely depressed, very depressed with good reason. And I just thought if there's a way to figure this out, you know, get out of this, this pain. I've been a reader my whole life. And I just thought to myself at age 18, the answer's got to be in a book somewhere. And as I wrote on my sub stack, of course, it's not, wasn't the answer was not in a book. I read hundreds of books and some books I had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of help from, and some books, maybe just one idea or one mental tool. But over the years, I built up a lot of mental tools to help me and you know it's not that i'm any better or smarter than anybody else it's just something it's like marketing and promotion that i i had the need to study it really in depth so you know i want to share some of that with everybody so that's what the substack is also sharing marketing and promotion for the for the uh paid subscribers so so anyway, I hope you're bored with that, Pete. Yeah. I'm sorry, I fell asleep. Okay. Um, let's see. What else we got Is it what here? It's like when I talk? Huh? Is it what it's like when I talk? What? Oh no, I'm very interested in everything you have to say. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh Speaking of a dollar or 99 cents today, I think it's 99 cents in Televore, Star Trek The Next Generation book 45 is on sale on Kindle. And some of the it's it's about the Great Rift. Are you familiar with this in Star Trek? Well, it some um, reviewers have, have called it a cosmic horror Star Trek Next Generation novel. Oh, cool. Okay. So I plunked down my 99 cents. In Televore, just like it sounds. Hmm. I think. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? Oh, yeah. This Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to interject, but you have a list. No, just a very short list. This Principle Rock is $1.99 today. Also. So if you're listening to this a year later, it may not be at all or anything, but it is right now. So what were you going to say, Bridget? I was just going to say, um, speaking of movies that I uh, I watched, I, I watch a creature feature on YouTube. So they show like a lot of really old movies, which is just like a comfort space for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I watched the movie Mephisto Waltz from like 71, 72. Uh -huh. Like a really, really young Alan Alda. And I have to say that was a pretty that was a pretty interesting movie. It was not the best movie I've ever seen, but it was it was enjoyable. It was kind of a interesting spin on the um well you could almost say thing on the doorstep or you could say um skeleton key had some vibes oh, along the zone but yeah i thought it, i thought it was a pretty interesting movie and it had music uh well as a huge plot point so that's always a bonus yeah yeah did uh have you, have you all ever seen that movie i don't think so mm. a long time ago um in a galaxy far far away 
I just got a kick out of Alan Alda kind of playing a creepy guy. Oh. Yeah, I think you can always go, you know, everyone knows Alan Alda from um from MASH. Yeah. But every once in a while I rewatch MASH and there's a couple episodes. I I I think there's a lot of episodes, but there's that where he like some of the stuff he's doing is funny, but also could be crossing the line. But then there's a couple episodes where he's just a complete whack job. Did, and, you know, you, they, and and not a nice person. Th there was a movie from the 90s, maybe mid early 90s. I think it was called was it Whispers in the Dark, where uh, he played a psychiatrist. And uh, one of his protégés is breaking up with her boyfriend and he and his wife are trying to help her through it. And someone's stalking her. He ends up being the bad guy. And it was like, mm. he started playing like the real goody two shoes friend, family man kind of thing. And, and then by the end, he's just, uh, you know, something out of Hitchcock kind of creep. Oh, wow. Uh Oh yeah, I see the um, falls a man Manhattan psychiatrist who finds a, herself in the midst of a homicide investigation after one of her patients is mysteriously murdered. I mean, I never heard that point plot point before. But the other one I always crazy. like is, Still and they theory. find that That's things are not as they find that things are not as they seem. I don't know right. that it's that original, <laughs> yeah. but but it was he played a good part, is what I remember. Mm. I'll have to watch that. It sounds interesting. So creature features, do they have things like beginning of the end? Uh probably. What's nice too is that they have um because they get the permissions, you know, to show the movie on their show. Um it's on the YouTube their YouTube channel for forever. So they have all kinds of movies on there going back several years. Oh, awesome. I I'm going to see if they have Monolith Monsters. I love monolith monsters. I think well the thing is the thing this is the one bad thing about hyperbeam. Uh well there are a couple bad things about it but the one bad thing is I cannot show DVDs. It's not possible for me to share DVDs. Mm. Yeah, the only thing about creature features is I mean it's a good or a bad point depending on what you're <laughs> but they have their little um you know host interlude banter in the movie. Um, sometimes they do interview different people um, as little breaks in between the movies. So if you're into that, you know, it's cool. But well, that's almost like a not, throwback. You can fast forward. <laughs> that's like throwbacks to Saturday Chiller Theater. Though, yeah, exactly. It? Exactly. So Hyperbeam, you can't, you, you can't use DVDs with it? Are you sure? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, I've not been able to make it work or find out where to make it work. Yeah, but you have an AOL out. email address. Well, I mean, if you can figure it out, great. But uh, it's like it, it's sharing streaming. It, it's not like it's screen sharing my computer because my individual experience when I'm showing a movie on Hyperbeam is sometimes for me, it hangs up for like full mm. two seconds and has to reconnect. And everyone else tells me it worked just fine for them as mm. it was going on. I and remember when I was trying to figure out how to show a DVD on cast. That there was definitely a learning curve and I had to get some kind of third party um program to get the sound to work because it was different with the DVD for some reason. But I know that's not totally relevant, but if anybody out there knows how to use hyperbeam and DVDs, there you uh, go. shoot me an email, lovecrafteasing at gmail.com. Um Matt, I, I'm sorry, I know that this has been so so hard on you, you know. Uh, it's, just, no, it's like there's some DVD. I acknowledge your pain. I, I, I have like, a, you know, what's the one that uh, Rick Lay wrote? Uh, a, a big paper on the Lovecraftian influences on it. What's that? 1960s black and white. Oh, Dark Intruder? Yeah, Dark Intruder. I wanted Dark to show Intruder. Intruder and Monolith Monsters as a double feature. I got the DVDs. I can't do it. I got best ofs from the film festival i want to share but uh, you know there's just some things i'd like to do that are you uh yeah you brave little soldier you're too precious for this world it's like i also have um 
issues with certain streaming services that don't let you do it. Like I'm really, it's not working for me with Netflix right now. I already told you why. And it's not ever going to work with Netflix. Uh, yeah, I know. No matter what streaming, not, no matter if you're using Hyperbeam or something else, that's, that's on Netflix. They, they don't want you to share anything with your friends and watch anything with your friends, apparently. Now, I can, if, if you need counseling about this, Matt, my office hours are every other Tuesday, 11 a.m. to 11.15. So if you want to make an appointment, talk about it. Or He's ignoring me. just meet everybody for group therapy down at the bar, like everybody else. All kidding aside, I really appreciate that Matt does this every Saturday night. It's a fun thing. So We had like 10 people at uh, last night so a little oh, that's great. bumping between like six and ten yeah um yeah just go to um well uh, we have a facebook no we don't just go to the facebook uh lovecraft easing facebook group and if you're not a member just ask to join and matt posts this every saturday uh and with instructions on how to get in there. So it so usually starts about 9.30. He starts playing things about 9.30 p.m. Eastern time every Saturday night, and the movie starts at, at 10 p.m. Eastern time, 9 Central, right? Is that correct? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. What else do we have to talk about? Uh, oh, this is pretty cool. Um. Amicus Productions rises from the grave with In the Grip of Terror Horror Anthology. Are you familiar with Amicus Productions? They used to do anthology movies. Yes, they were kind of like the poor man's hammer house of horror. Well, they're coming up with a new one, new film called In the Grip of Terror. The, um, the poster is really cool looking. Um, let's see here. And screen share. This is an article on on Collider. And there we go. See that? They're going to do articles from. There's the. They're going to do articles from or stories from Lovecraft, Ambrose Bierce, E.F. Benson. So this is a really good thing. You guys seem excited. Do that, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't know what you did, what? but you took me out of full screen mode when you did that. When I did the screen share? Yeah. Why are you in full screen mode? Because I like to see your big smiling face. <laughs> Why wouldn't that be? Wonders of Zoom. Well, you, yeah, you'll have to ask your AI assistant about that. So, yeah. Uh, there's this. <laughs> yes, Pete, I am trying to get underneath your skin with oh, the fog. I'm also trying to get under Kelly Young's skin. Because the fog is one of my favorite movies. Do I think it's Lovecraftian, like the video says? No, I don't. But I knew it pissed both of you off. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's like. Tell me you've never you've never written or read anything on the subject without telling me you've never read or written anything on the subject. To call the fog a Lovecraftian movie has to be the stupidest thing you could. It is stupid. It's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Did you actually watch the video? Yeah. I see. I didn't. I just wanted to annoy both of you. It's just. Oh my God! It's a ghost. It's a ghost revenge story. Well, my work here is done. I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, but you know, no. There's there's references no. to like Arkham, <laughs> Arkham Reef, and so forth, but yes. it's not. Yeah. What, man? Uh, it's just it's not that good. I mean, it's just an <laughs> eighties cheese fest. Muting. You're. I just muted you. No, in in the look, look it's in the great cheesy movie, it's like it's okay. It's not to fight about it. Good. One of my favorite eighties cheesy horror movies. 
But yes. I've never talked about it again after I saw it because I didn't need to. So you've not seen it more than once? That's so weird. Okay. I mean, let's get back to talking about movies like that, you know, like um, Return of the Living Dead, because that is just highbrow. <laughs> you too. You too. Bridget. Bridget. I freaking love that movie. <laughs> if you yeah, love on. me, you'll let me eat your brain. She does not. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We can send more about whether a strawberry is really a berry, but you know, do you really send care? more paramedics? So. Oh, by the okay, but has has anybody watched um the season finale for Strange New Worlds? Yes. No. Uh, no, so, I got I got hung up when they did the animated episode, and I thought it was kind of silly. And then I heard there was a musical episode. And it was thought, supposed to be silly. Yes. No, but it's like there's only ten episodes a season, and you're gonna spend it on this stuff. Oh come on! There was a lot of silly stuff in the original Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, there were, but they had twenty two episodes a season. All right. Anyway, twenty two silly episodes a season. I love it. <laughs> Bridget, you saw the last episode. Yes. So did you catch the reference to Firefly? It's like they disguised the ship as with with all the oh yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah. oh a zombie ship <laughs> yes <laughs> pretty standard there's like a bunch of movies <laughs> yeah just it's just like zombie movies i love that and then the spock's like watch a zombie movie yeah <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> anyway yeah there's and a... the gorn the gorn oh my god the creature design for the gorn was just freaking awesome yeah it was so good my wife is like Wait, the Gorn have spacesuits? <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so good. Why wouldn't they? I mean, lizards need to breathe. I don't yeah, know. no, I don't. Yeah, it's just sort of like. And, but then I, I, I took a screenshot of that scene um, with uh, Spock in, in on the bridge, and then I, I compared it to a scene from one of the Alien films. Mm -hmm. Man, they nailed that. I mean. I had mentioned that they were doing an homage to Alien when they made the Gorn mm -hmm. appear the first time, but they nailed that whole scene. Yeah. Yes, it was. I had heard that too that they were using Alien as a reference, and I thought that was cool because uh, Star Trek: First Contact, Jonathan Frakes directed it, and he literally said that he got a lot of ideas from the Alien and Aliens for First yeah. Contact. So I thought that was really cool too. Uh, there's a let's see a couple movies coming out soon one's coming out next week talk about this one first uh, this is from bloody disgusting a brand new lovecraft inspired horror movie uh, we'll, we'll know when we see it right it, titled menor m-i-n-o-r-e is on the way and our friends over at room org have debuted the absolute bonkers first trailer this week Tapping into the otherworldly madness of Lovecraft's best terror tales, the Menor trailer is loaded with massive tentacle beasts and gruesome moments of bloody violence. I haven't seen the trailer yet. I'll watch it later. See, in, in Lovecraft's movie, his heroes always faint. They, mm -hmm. they, in his story, but the only, you know who the only action hero was in all of Lovecraft? Sweet Ermengarde. She threw the her, she threw her boyfriend off a train out of a window yeah. and it's like no one else in Lovecraft fiction has like done so much as lift a pinky otherwise and so Except much with so little in the beast in the cave he killed something with a rock well, here's one of the monsters apparently that is a lot of tentacles that's pretty cool so and I'm going to watch the trailer after the show you did it again what can't you watch the can't you put the trailer on for all of us to watch and then we can comment on it the, uh, theoretically, yes. In actuality, wow. my with my abilities, probably no. So, um, Brightwood, Time Loop. And I know you love time travel movies, um, Pete. Time Loop horror movie takes you into the woods next week. See what they did there. Uh, being stuck together in an endless loop. Uh, Jen and Dan's marriage is on the rocks. 
with Jen seriously thinking about ditching Dan. Actually, it says ending it for good, but well, when the pair go on a jog, because that's what couples who are about to divorce do, around a local pond in an attempt to hash things out, it's a good jog and talk. Yeah, I've always found that that works really, really well. Yeah. In oh, November, I've got some things I want to chat with you about when, when I see you in November. Let's take a little jog and, and hash everything out. Uh, jog around a local pond and attempt to hash things out. They find themselves running in circles. Well, yeah, if they're jogging around a pond, they're running in circles. As the exit trail vanishes and they repeatedly return to the same spot. I do that too. It's called, but I walk. It's called walking around the pond. And then I get back to the same spot. Being stuck together in an endless loop would be bad enough. But when a silent hooded killer appears and starts tracking them down, the couple must figure out how to survive together or apart. So it's a slasher movie with a time loop thrown in, I guess. Yeah, that's called Happy Death Day. Right. Which was a really good movie. Yeah. You know, I, I'm so after all these Star Trek and whatever, I'm so tired of these time travel stories, I guess. I mean, I I used to like the genre a lot more, but the more I think about it, the more I think it's just preposterous because if you went back to this place in time a thousand years ago, the earth wouldn't even be in the same place and you'd just be frozen in space, right? Yeah, go on, please. The earth is kind of yes. like it's the whole, all of space is moving in relationship to each other and nothing is fixed. So how are you going to like fix Maybe it? Maybe the that? time machine factors the earth's movement in. Yeah, sure it does. Do that. Okay. If you've got an if you got a quantum computer about the size of Minneapolis. Well, you'd need one to time travel in the first place, wouldn't you? No, it's like um I just call my friend in Japan and they're in the future already. It's like, mm. what, is it the, is it Jeff Thomas? I think he has a story about, you know, like some elder God that comes, you know, comes, comes back to the world and re materializes in the middle of like I-95 <laughs> and it's just immediately smushed. <laughs> That's sort of like what happened on both seasons of People of Earth, which I'm really sorry it got canceled. People of Earth? What's People of Earth? It's about uh, a support group for people who say they've had alien encounters, but it turns out they all have had alien encounters, and the aliens are no Yeah, more... Are these spoilers? No, the, it turns out the aliens in this show are no more competent than any person, you know, and everyone's just a complete fucked <laughs> up loser. It was really funny and very enjoyable show with an with an ongoing plot, and uh, they just canceled after two seasons. Mm. I was enjoying it. Um, I'm when I was yeah, go ahead. I've been watching the trailer for Brightwood in the background, and it's really interesting watching it without sound. And it's <laughs> like I pretty much already kind of tell what this movie is, but I still want to watch it because to me, it seems like less like, oh, it's trying to be realistic time travel. I think it's more allegory just watching it. It's like, you know, a couple and they're doing something mundane and they're doing it over and over and over again, admits trying to work out issues and things. And then they show the shot in the trailer that's like her in the hoodie. So I think what they I give away everything in the trailer. Yeah, so I think oh, it's, I hate it that. Seems like the people fighting them are themselves. Like they're fighting themselves. I think it's all psychological allegory. I don't think it's trying to be anything real. But oh, that's as bad as what lies beneath one of the trailers gave away. Mm -hmm. Something about the husband. Yeah. Which yeah. if you knew, so, if you know that going into what lies beneath, you're not going to enjoy the movie as much. Yeah. Oh, man. The trailer yeah. just ruined this movie for me. Now. It kind of did, was. but I still want to watch it because I'm like, what are they trying to say? You know, it's interesting. But about back to the time travel thing, I don't, 
I don't know, like when I think about things like that, like time loop or stories like that, I don't think they're, I think the whole point is they're out of time and space as we know it. So it's different. Yeah, man. And it's almost in an alternate universe at that point. So it's not affecting or being affected by our universe. It's like, it's like when a bubble rises up from the, from the liquid and it's on the top of the liquid, it's like something else at that point. So there was a really bad time loop movie called the triangle. Oh my gosh. I love that. Actually, it is bad. But I still enjoy it. it. It's bad, but it had some, you know, it's bad in the sense that it was executed poorly. But I think they had some really good fucking ideas. Yeah, yeah. And she was ex- executed many times. Yeah. I mean, as as if you had had a competent director, some competent actors, it could have been mm. good. Bless you. <laughs> it made you sneeze. Bless you. Oh. But yeah, you know, it's like, and I kind of really loved like the, it's like, oh yeah, I'm out. And like, no, you're, it's just, yeah. Starting the loop again. Kind of like 1408 in a way, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to read a book and you should really all kidding aside about just the ultimate time travel uh, book, it's called, uh, the man who folded himself. Uh, you've read that, haven't you, Pete? Yeah, by David Gerald. Yeah, David Gerald, the guy who wrote the Tribbles episode and much more. I never Trek. finished the Qatar series. Yeah, that's t- okay. So a friend- we're talking about the man who folded himself. Yeah, Bridget, Springboard. you obviously understand time travel much better than than Carpenter here. So you got to you got to check that book out. So, yeah, I haven't read that one. I've read There Will Be Time. Ah, it's my favorite. Yeah, it's really good. What really about good. The, what about All the chronoliths? Have you read the chronoliths? No, that's yeah. but that's interesting time travel. I think actually, don't read any of the other books, but the first book, Hyperion by Daniel Simmons, has really got brilliant time travel in it. Oh so, yeah, I have that book. It's in, it's in my pile. I, need I tried, it. I tried years ago. Yeah. Mm. I like um. Uh, Piers Anthony has a book about Kronos. Uh, what is it called? Uh, something in the hourglass. Uh, bearing an hourglass. Yes, bearing an hourglass. I really liked that book too. Their thought on time about yeah. how when Kronos assumes the job, he lives backwards like Merlin. Right. Yeah, that was neat. Bearing what? Bearing so, an hourglass. I love that whole series. Uh-huh. It's one of my favorites. I check that out, but. We're- Hang on one second, Pete. I just want to say there's a character who lives backwards in time in the Som- Somnambulist uh, book. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Pete. Um, so appears Anthony's incarnations of immortality books. Yes. Uh, starts with death. On a pale um, horse. Yeah, on a pale horse. Then uh, incarnation of immortality. I think there's five books in the whole series. Seven. Being, seven. Okay. Can I read? The sixth one's about Satan, and the seventh one is about God. Yeah, okay. Which is you can read you can read them wow. as standalones, but they do cross over. Yes, the but, six and seven you kind of have to read last, but you can read the other five in the any order. Okay, that's good to know. Yes, um, hmm. <laughs> Piers Anthony. Yes. Hmm. Well, okay, so yeah, look, Xanth made a lot of money for him and continues. Yeah, good, to you know, good on him. He paid for his right? whole for that series. Yeah. But this series is not goofy like that. Yeah. This is Have you read the books, Matt? Uh, I bogged down after three or four. But by that time, I'd like gotten so sick of everything that came after a song for Chameleon. And I was, he read, he wrote this one book called Cthone, I think. Thone. Yep. Cause, yeah. Uh, and uh, I thought I liked it, but then I realized. I was uh, uh, really reading way too much into what the guy's writing. Um, Can I read the time travel one first without yeah, says this book it. too? Bearing yeah. an hourglass. You know yeah. what? There's no book police that are going to come to your office and drag you out for. No, I just, I just mean, is there? 
stuff in book one that may not going to enjoy it as much. No. Okay. no I think at that the point there was very little overlap at all, right? All right. I think, I think six I and seven have to be read first. The one about um, the three fates, basically. I read that one first, so I read them all out of order. Okay. But it's just you'll get more out of six and seven if you've read the other ones first. Okay, I'll remember that. Uh, okay, so all right, I got uh, bearing an hourglass up here. Okay, Minori, what else do we have here? Oh, this is really cool. Uh, Canadian. Who is this? Michael Kelly's Press. I'm blanking on the name. Undertow. Undertow Press. He's got a. He's doing an anthology uh, called Northern Nights. He's got a, a call out to writers. You have to be Canadian because that's right. what it's about. And this this looks so great. I can't wait. And so for years there was a him so. there was an anthology series called Northern Stars. Oh really? Okay. That only was, was limited to Canadians only. Um, so. He quotes a couple of things. Uh, here's from Blackwood, the Wendigo. Deep silence fell about the little camp, planted there so audaciously in the jaws of the wilderness. The lake gleamed like a sheet of black glass beneath the stars. The cold air pricked in the draughts of night that poured their silent tide from the depths of the forest. With messages from distant ridges and from lakes just beginning to freeze, there lay the already faint, bleak odors of coming winter. Northern, northern nights. Did I say northern lights? I meant northern no, nights. Night. Winter is coming, is all I heard. Yeah. It's a proposed horror dark fiction anthology in the vein of previous anthologies of Canadian speculative fiction. Oh, I'm at Northern Stars. There you go. Hmm. Black glossy lakes, dark woods, ancient pines and maples, abandoned highways, ghost towns, preternatural light, the midnight sun, and can uncanny valleys. I mean, I just can't. I wish this was already out. I'll have to check out Northern Stars. You're you're very you know you're very well informed, Pete. And no, even, I just read a lot. Yeah, well, and it's a lot of useless trivia. It's the same thing, isn't it? No, no. And I say I've read a lot, but really, what I've done is I've like I've been to a lot of bookstores. You know, yeah. actually, Mike, uh, I I wonder about Undertow Publications. Uh, I don't know if you talked to the guy. They stopped doing their series, The Year's Best Weird Fiction. Yeah, so they're back. they're winding down. He's, oh, really? They're getting ready to shut or something? No, I don't think I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him that. He it's been several years since they put uh, out. I, I just think that you know running a small press is really hard. Oh, it's it's time consuming and it's very hard to even make enough money to break even, let alone pay yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. Uh, by the way, I'm not the only one who thinks that Pete is well-informed. I was playing around with GPT-4 the other nice. night. AI. Oh, we need to talk about that. Okay, we will. Um so I thought, all right, I'm going to do a, a vanity question first, and then I'm going to ask about Pete. So here's what it says about Pete. Mm -hmm. Well, I asked ChatGPT4, and I also asked Google Bard, okay? Uh, it, here's what it has to say about Pete. Bard, I'm sorry, does not know who you are. GPT-4 says Pete Relic is an author known for his contributions to Lovecraftian fiction, a sub-genre of horror that builds on the themes, settings, and mythologies established by H.P. Lovecraft. Relic has written numerous stories and novels that play with this in this universe, expanding upon Lovecraft's ideas and introducing his own unique takes. 
One of Rollick's notable works is Reanimators, a novel that brings new life to the story of Herbert West, a character from Lovecraft's Herbert West Reanimator. See how that works. Yeah. Rollick's tales often weave together various threads from the wider Lovecraft universe, blending characters, locations, and plot lines in, invent in inventive ways. Here's my favorite paragraph. In addition to his writing, Pete Rollick is a member of the Lovecraftian community and has participated in discussions, panels, and other events. I think that's us right there, the podcast, other events. Yeah, we're other events. Right, related to the genre. His deep knowledge of Lovecraft's works, I'm embarrassing him, and his ability to create new and engaging stories within that framework make him a recognized figure within the world of Lovecraftian horror. That's very nice, Mike. What did it say about me and Bridget? <laughs> I did not ask. I did not ask, but I, I will if you want me to. No, here's, here's what I'm going to say. It's all bullshit. No, it, it seems pretty close yeah. to me. Okay. That's pretty legit. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is out on the internet somewhere. and it's just so, Yeah, well, that's, that's my point. I guess, you know, somebody else, a whole bunch of other people said things like that. Well, and it likes you. It likes it you. really it likes you. So here's what I'm going to say. There was a court ruling yesterday by a federal judge that said AI artwork can't be copyrighted. Good. So let's hope that that spreads to film, literature, music, script writing, everything. There's an article about about you know is AI going to destroy art and artists and so forth that I want to get to in a second here. But GPT-4 knew who I was, apparently. They're cut, they, they, it's cut off knowledge in September 2021, but it's a better AI than Bard. They are, no, Bard knows who I am, too. Um, so it likes me. It really, really likes me, too. I'll keep this short because Matt's looking pretty bored with us. As of my last update in September 2021, Mike Davis is the creator and the editor of the Lovecraft easing. Blah, 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 blah. Mike Davis has played a significant role in bringing together a community of Lovecraft enthusiasts through the easing, as well as by hosting podcasts, video chats, and other events centered on Lovecraftian themes and horror literature in general. Under his guidance, this is nice, the Lovecraft Easing has published numerous stories, articles, and other pieces of content that contribute to the broader appreciation and understanding of Lovecraft's work and the horror genre. P.S. None of this would be possible without Matthew Carpenter and Bridget Burnmar. Said that at the end. No, -uh, you so it did mention that. No, it's, I swear it said that. Yep. <laughs> uh, there's an article on AI, Pete, about it's, it's on Wired and, it, and it's titled AI or, or No, It's Always Too Soon to Sound the Death Knell of Art. And it talks about when the, when the camera came out, people were having more or less the same conversation about how, you know, why do you need anyone to paint a painting, for example, anymore? Comments, questions, you're muted. I think that's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, it's a little bit more. Because the concern is that the computer is grabbing people's artwork to make yeah. more yeah. artwork. And then people aren't going to go buy the artwork from the original artist when they can just get something from AI themselves that's free or cheaper. I, see, I think that if my view is, if they use that art to train up the AI, don't they owe some kind of royalties to the artists who use the art to train it with? Totally yes. agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I agree with this article. I wanted to see, get your guys' comments. Because mm -hmm. a lot I of people mean, are worried about like, this, not just artists, writers too, and other creative yeah. people. I mean, when the music streaming started, we were having similar conversations, right? Of just, oh, is music streaming going to end music and there was a lot of oh no it's just a new tool but then it's like here we are years later and in a way it has I wouldn't say ended but it's greatly changed the business because 
yeah, as stuff's being sold differently and, oh yeah, cool. I'm making pennies off of whatever it is on iTunes or this and that and the other. I mean, it's the same thing of why the artists, the writers and the actors are on strike. It's just, it's changed the, the consumer environment for art. Um, it's, it's happening in medicine too. Um, if you can imagine, um, looking at pathology slides, trying to find that one clump of cells that is abnormal, that requires a lot of concentration and even the best pathologists are going to miss something by overlooking it because they have to look at like a hundred slides in an hour or, you know, something like that. So what they've done, they've done two things. Uh, they have trained like by showing the computer thousands of slides and then it's like it's teaching itself the difference and then they came at it the other way and they showed it thousands of slides of the pathology so then it would then go look at the slides for the changes but also just they trained it from looking at the slides for whatever was different between the slides on its own but the way it's used is it's it's being touted as a time saver that is the it will present the pathologist like look at these particular clumps on these particular slides and see if you agree that this is where the diagnostic material is. They're doing the same thing with radiographs where there are lots of, or you could do the same thing with a, with a blood smear, you know, a, a prepared blood smear where you're looking for like lymphoblasts or something circulating in the serum. In, so in the as a doctor, what's your opinion on this? Is it a time okay. saver or is it? I think for those things, it could be very helpful as a tool it's hard to, for me to see how it replaces a certified pathologist or radiologist at this point, but this is early days, you know? Yeah. And for how much, um, how much telemedicine where the physician is just talking to someone like this, what if you could do this with, um, say, you weren't looking at my picture, you're just typing your symptoms and I'm asking back questions there may be some kind of AI component in that, just looking for that one turn of phrase that will raise your hackles. But for me, it's like, this is at the very end of my career. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be like 80 and being wheeled into the hospital. And the doctor comes up, Roger, Roger. It seems to me that, that AI, it seems to me that AI is best used as a tool, not an end all. But like you said, it's early days. We're going to look back at 2023 as when it all changed. You know, AI got really big this year. I'll be happy. I'll be just watching my AI generated content, eating my bowl of squash. Yeah, exactly. There was a there's a writer, really good. the writer on Substack, where she she says that Goodreads and Amazon has to do a far better job of weeding these out there were like three or four books written under her name that were AI generated. Wow. Yeah. And she finally got them off. Amazon finally listened to her, but only because she's a writer who's really visible. And yep. in, in her sub stack, she says, I worry about authors who are not as visible as me. You know? So the first go around, they refused. Yes, they did. You know, it, only when she went public, it was how bad this was were they finally able to she was finally able to get those things off her off her author page yeah the, and you know the they you know the old uh spider-man saying with great power comes great responsibility i absolutely believe that depending you know whatever kind of power that is they have power in this area it is their responsibility to weed through these things to so, take an interest in this and not just be passive. So I want to roll things back to when Bridget was talking about music and how, how like when uh, streaming came out. So the vehicle that I picked up as a second vehicle after ha not having a car for almost four years is a 2012. It does not have Apple Play. So I can't connect my phone up to it. Mm -hmm. it and stream my music okay. so but it, it does have a cd player does it have bluetooth yes well then you can but, stream 
No, it won't. It will not stream. No, you hook your phone to the Bluetooth speakers and stream. Oh, to your I understand. Phone. It won't. It won't. It it won't do it. It will only stream when I get a phone call. Are you sure this isn't some sort of um, you know, just high operator like issue? That. No, it's not. Okay. All right. Anyway, just, that's how much the world has changed in eleven years. Yeah, but my point is that I had sa- I had saved a small stack of CDs from my the great purge that my wife might mainly did make me get rid of and so those are the cds that are in my car so it's like dreams in the witch house (laughs) dr horrible sing-along blog nice (laughs) the um bloodletting by um uh, concrete blonde and like eight depeche mode cds See, CDs are useful again for you and not just as Frisbees. So it's my wife who drives his car on a regular basis, taking my daughter to college and back every day. So I now hear them come through the door singing all the music that I love. (laughs) Brainwashing in effect. (laughs) And yeah, so I'm seeing an impact of like CDs you know, in the car on my, my wife and kids. Mm. You know, this might sound hokey, but for everybody that's nervous about this stuff and other things that come up with technology and, and just in life, I think about Star Trek six when Spock says history is replete with turning points, you know, and it's so true. Things are going to change always. And you can't do anything about it. What you can do is control how you react to it and what you do about it. Yeah, on the other hand, I kind of like the guys that went after the cotton gins. <laughs> I'm not talking about that, you know. Well, no, but it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the, the whole the whole neo the whole Luddite movement was to go after, you know, the emerging industrial complex. Well, I don't mean it in the sense that, you know, Amazon should be passive. I'm talking about, you know, your average person out there who's worried about this. You, and I'm not saying you should be passive either. I'm saying there are things that are going to happen, changes to technology that no matter how much you might wish it, you you can't control it. You can only control what happened, how you react to things in life. I mean, I know we all know that, but it bears repeating, you know. So there's also that tiny little island off India where they're still in the Stone Age and they kill everybody that comes steps one foot on the beach. Yeah, so they don't want they don't want us there for good reason. Yeah, <laughs> is that yeah. island still a thing? Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, some missionary went there a, a couple of years ago and he didn't last long. Well, I bet he learned his lesson. He'll never preach to anyone again. No, he won't. Anyway. So, anyway, if you're if you're going back, if you're Canadian, look up Undertow, Google Undertow Publications and Northern Knights because uh, they want stories from you. So, so yeah, all right. Shadows over Main Street Three is about to come out, yes. right? Do you have a story on that? No, I didn't even know it was happening. I, I'm actually lamenting this. I'm so focused on some of my work that I, I'm not seeing calls. Mm. Thing. That's not a bad thing, Pete, to be that that busy. Mm. You, know, you can't you can't do everything as prolific as you are. So it's it's good that you've got all these other projects. It's not bad. It's a good thing that you wished them into the corn. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, but the the only reason I say that is because like I, I kind of wish that. I didn't have to buy the book. I would just get oh, my author's copy. Oh, okay. Okay. Now I get it. Yeah. You're going to get a copy of the book. They're sending me a, a, a review copy, digital. Okay. Nice. I mean, I know you don't like I, digital. I hate digital. But maybe I can okay. talk. I can, maybe you want me to try and talk them into a print for you? Yeah, sure. I'll try. But they probably don't have one yet. No, they don't. So. So. So, yeah. I uh, hate. Check this out. No. 
Oh. Sherlock Holmes. Is the writing backwards? No, it's not. That's just for me. No, it's just not. Got this in the mail just out of the blue the other day. Wow. All the, the Sherlock Holmes books. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, just out of the blue, a Lovecraft Easy podcast listener sent them to me. Was it Alan? No. Because he's a big look, he's a big Holmes guy. This person did not want me to mention their name, but they sent it because I'm a big Sherlock Holmes guy. Okay. Yeah, isn't it nice? It's just really nice of him. Very nice. it, it's funny you brought that up. It is funny because you know that secret project I'm working on. Yeah, but it's a secret. It's a secret. Yeah. But um, he's just read the last bow by Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a genius idea. Yeah, we just not. We, I and I, this is how I want to talk about it. And I was there. Yeah. You saw the idea on the tree. You plucked it. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, but yeah, he just he just read the last bow, and uh, he hated it. He finds it pretentious. So, yeah. Anyway, that's great. I have all the um, Sherlock Holmes books on audiobooks read by Stephen Fry. It, oh, nice. Pretty- oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those that are great. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so we shadows over Baker Street. I mean, shadows over Main Street. See, I got Sherlock Holmes in the rain. The Sherlock, the Lovecraftian anthology, Shadows Over Baker Street. So that's uh, an old John Peelan book from like twenty plus years ago. That you're yeah. bitter about still? No, not that one. Oh right. Okay. John Pelin left us all with a bad taste in our mouth. Did he? Is he still alive? Oh, oh. No, no, he died. He's he was a big, big time smoker. Oh. Um, and he died. You know, Centipede Press had been selling his library. They still have a few of his books up for sale, I guess, to help out his family. Okay. Did you get the email today, Matt? Uh, what was the one that we were looking at? I I forget. I just I think I ordered. Uh, Cold Moon over Babylon or something. Okay. I think he just put up um Cold Moon over Babylon. I read that a year or two ago. That's McDowell, right? Yeah. Yeah. He just put up the Club Dumas. Yeah, I, that was the one that I ordered today. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a book about books. You, yeah. You know, yeah. That's, why, that's one of the things that's so attractive about it. It's kind of like we just for my book club read The Unlikely Escape of Uriah Heap. Which is really a book about people who read Dickens. Okay. You know, um, the first third was pretty good, and it just sort of went on and on after that. And I only had to finish it because it was a book club, you know. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would have punted. But similarly, it was about. It's really a book for people who love books. Uh, hey, so listen, uh, remember, folks, that it really helps when you comment on the YouTube video. Uh, you know, uh, tell me what you've been reading lately, because, uh, you know, give me some recommendations and, uh, you know, or, you know, let me know what you th- what you thought of the books that we've recommended or whatever you want to say. Uh, I got yeah. I got to run. All right. But remember, the prize is Philadelphia. So send an email to easing prizes at gmail dot com. Okay. In the subject heading. It is an absolutely boss graphic novel. I think everyone will like it. Did you say boss? Yeah. Boss. It's 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 uh I'm down with all the Hepcats. I got this yeah. Are those the Hepcats from Ulthar? Yeah. Okay. I'll see ya. See ya, Matt. We're almost done anyway. So so um hey, I lost a couple of patrons and I asked them why and they said financial reasons, and that's very, very, very understandable. It but has if, nothing to do with me hope hosting Friday night. Uh uh no, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I doubt it. They weren't there. So, so no. Um, it, you know, if, if you, this is literally, the, the Patreon literally, I really mean this, is the only thing that is keeping the podcast and the other Lovecraft Easing projects from in existence. In other words, if the Patreon is no longer there for some reason or it goes down sufficiently. I can't do this anymore. I've got to 
make money some other way. Um, and I'd rather do this. I think a lot of people enjoy it. And if you're one of those people, um, you know, please consider it. The, just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon or, or uh, I've got the link always in the show notes. I also added some tiers the other day, ironically, right before this. And um, not added tiers, but added some things to the tiers that are pretty cool. And I'm not going to be a used car salesman and go over them all now, but I'm going to, I'll post them on the, on the Patreon and on the Lovecraft Easing website in the next couple of days. So you can, you can find it there or just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. I mean, if you enjoy the show and you can spare five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, whatever, then, you know, please do. I really appreciate it. I had a Patreon, uh, I posted about this in the group, Facebook group. And I want to say, you know, give, uh, thank you so much to all my patrons. This guy, um, his name is Alan, by the way. Might not be the Alan you're thinking of, Pete. But thank you, Alan. He went from $25 a month to $50 a month, which is the top tier. I really appreciate it. He sent me a note and said that hopefully it it makes up for, you know, some of the recent losses. So, um, thanks a lot. And that's all I'll say about that. Other than to say free stuff to help the podcast is commenting on YouTube, um, reviews on Apple reviews on Spotify. Those are the three main things that you can do. So anything else we want to talk about guys? Mm -hmm. No. What's, What's There's lots here? of things I would like to talk about, but you know, it's a family show. <laughs> There's things I would like to talk about too, but I am in mourning over the death of nuance the last few years. Hmm. You know, it doesn't doesn't seem to matter if it have a sorry. That's deep. Yeah, it doesn't seem to matter if 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 it's an opinion from, let's say, the left as opposed to the right, um, whether it's politics or beliefs or what, whatever. It's, or sarcasm? Whatever. It's almost, nobody wants to meet in the middle and say, hey, let's discuss this. If you say, I don't agree with you on this, but let's let's chat about it. You can, you no, know, all the other side seems to hear is, you know, you're a terrible person because you don't agree with me. Or you're full of hate because you don't agree with me. You know, it's... I, I don't get it. So rather than there's a couple of topics I would like to talk about, but I, I'm, a, I think that's exactly what would happen or I'm afraid it would happen. So anyway, was that vague enough for you? <laughs> I'm, I'm always reminded of that, that, you. that, you know, in cousin Vinny, where they're doing the, the interviews of the, 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 the cop is interviewing the two kids, yeah. like Ralph Macchio. And the and it says and then the cop says and then you shot the sheriff <laughs> and the kid says I shot the sheriff I shot the sheriff at least you didn't like, shoot the deputy and you know he's like in disbelief right but then at trial you know there says and what did he say after that he said I shot the sheriff I shot the sheriff or I I shot I shot the the cashier that's what I meant I don't um, remember. You know, it's it's sort of you know, like once you change the inflection, it means something completely different. I oh, I see what you're saying. You know, and you know, so what was one sentence in, it set in disbelief or sarcasm, and now is just uh, takes it as an admission of guilt. So you know, I can see where the subtleties of language have sort of can can be manipulated, and we don't understand that anymore. And I, I kind of blame this on the fact that we don't have to take debate or speech anymore in in high school and college. But, you know. Not sure that that's, it, it's that simple. No. But it but could be part of it. It's also the fact that, you know, civics has been taught by uh, football coaches for the last 25 years. And part of it is so much of debating on the internet is what? basically text right text only yeah. so there's no like you said i shot the sheriff or i shot the sheriff you know 
those four words are exactly the same, but not if you're reading them, not if they don't use italics or anything. Right. Yeah. This, this goes back to the, uh, I had, you know, let's, let's eat grandma. You know, <laughs> it all depends on where you put the comma. Eat, shoes and leave, eat, yeah, shoots eat, eat. and leaves. Yeah. All these games that, um, you can play with, uh, text. Yeah. It's super important. And so anyway, um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm not gonna talk about that. Oh, I did promise my cousin. This has absolutely nothing to do with anything. So if people want to tune out, you can. My my cousin, when I was I speaking of being out of the cult, I worked in Fort Worth at this bagel place for several years, right? And my cousin, my younger cousin needed a job. And so I got him a job there. It was basically every day he and I were in the back making bagels and standing on the bagel making machine, feeding the dough in, you know, putting them into the oven. It was, it was a fun job. But he thought, you know, it would be a good idea to one day to stick a kick me sign on my back. And I didn't notice it for hours. So I'm like, Brian, I'm going to get you back. He's like, he, he's, he's, he's a big guy. You know, he's always been a bigger guy than me. So he's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to get you back. That's what I'm going to do, kid. And uh, so I let him forget about it for a few weeks. And then one day I put a niacin in his drink, like three pills crushed up of niacin. You know what that does, right, Pete? Does anyone? I did. If you, if you take one niacin vitamin, it's going to make your face and your body feel really flushed. Okay. I don't know what it does for you, why people take it. And I don't even care enough to Google it. But um, I felt really bad about this. I felt really bad about this for 30 years. <laughs> he got redder than red. He was sweating. He was dripping with sweat. And he goes in the bathroom. He's there for the, in there for like 45 minutes. And he comes out and he's like, you really got me back. <laughs> so, yeah, I was a terrible person at the time. Occasionally. Okay. You're, you're muted again. You are a bad person. I know. A very bad person. I would never do that today. So, wait, why did your cousin want you to talk about this? To confess after all these years? <laughs> Uh, I told him I was going to talk about it. Apology. Yeah, yeah, it is a public apology. Okay, fair. It's a public apology. Yeah. Anyway, um, next week, I apologize if I bored you two and the, the entire listenership with that. But yeah, I write Mike's such a nice guy. Mike's such a nice guy. Not always. I haven't always been a nice guy. I had to learn to be a nice guy. <laughs> uh. Anyway. Um. You know that says something. What? That it takes effort and time, you know, to improve yourself. So well, it's like that old saying. Really I'm a man, but I can change. You're what? I'm a man, <laughs> but I can change if I have to. I guess. Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, but you're absolutely right, Bridget. You know, um, I mean, I I had no, you know, I didn't grow up with any good examples in front of me so but i did want to be a good person i did want to do the right thing i i still do and um i you know we all learn to do better hopefully if we're trying yeah. i mean some people get to age 90 and they really haven't learned from their experiences in life they just don't learn the lesson and they're even crankier than when they were 18 but Anyway, oh, I thought we were we were we were admitting that that's our problem. That you're ninety. No, that we're we haven't changed that much since we were. I I, I thought this was like Grumpy Gus is anonymous club, and we're all just like yeah. yeah I too am a grumpy Gus. I don't know, Pete. It seems like you're going to stick with this wife, too, if you ask me. Oh, well, well, yeah, but what she said is like the only we we've both been married before, and she said the only way out this time is death. So, 
Well, if, if that's the case, if I were you, I'd be really afraid. Yeah. Yeah. I'm absolutely, I, I'm absolutely, you know, terrified. I mean, that literally is the vow, so there's that. Eh, oh, okay. Uh, I've only killed three people in my life. I'm just, you know. You've only killed what? Three people in my life. Your ex-wives? No, just one ex-wife. You killed her? Or she uh, died of natural causes from your stress? I, I signed paperwork. That's all. That's that? all. Oh, I'm sorry, Pete. I... That's okay. Didn't mean to. No. I know it. You know it? Yeah, you've told me. Before. I've told this story, yeah. Mm. She so listens you. to you. It's sad. Yeah, it is sad. But... That's all the listeners need to know. Yeah. Okay. Pete's a nice guy, too. And Brett just nicer than both of us put together. So, anyway. I huh? it's a happy ball. Mm -hmm. I don't consider myself. I okay. I I tell people that I'm a, a a good man. That doesn't mean I'm a nice man. And you know, there's a subtle distinction there. I think that the scary part is assuming that you're a good person. It's like no, it takes work to be a good person. It takes yeah, work. And I I don't want to do yeah. it. I, I'm just not into it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Pete. <laughs> oh my God. Like, eh, work at being a good person or. Just, I don't know. You know, well, you, you know you, what? You're a liar. You are. <laughs> I'll so tell you what, folks. You're he, a good person. So you're a liar. He has been a hell of a good friend of me. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. You know, there have been times when seemed like half the universe disagreed with something I did. And, and I disagree too, but I told you you had a valid viewpoint. Yeah, but the point is you were able to say, I don't agree with everything you said, but I'm still your friend. Yeah. You know, that's, and that's that's what we call children. That's what we like to call nuance and good friendships. Yes. Yeah. And that's also a civil society means I don't have to agree with everything. Right. See how I circled back to the death of nuance with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, good friend right there. I have a dream, Pete. It's not a little dream. It's just a dream. And my dream is, and I hope you don't find this too crazy, is that if a writer were to publish a book, that they would think coming on this podcast would actually be a wise thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Josh Brownerman next week. Let's see who's who's after that. On that note. Yeah. Apropos of nothing. Uh, Josh Brownerman, Daniel Ba. Oh, Richard Chismar has written another Boogeyman book. It's a prequel, nice. Becoming the Boogeyman. We're going to have him on September the 10th. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. all right. Anyway. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, especially to all my patrons. And thanks to you guys for being here. See, Matt didn't stick around, so he doesn't get to thank you. Yeah, fuck Matt. Not even going to pay him. I'll tell you that right now. Wait, Matt gets paid? Mm, no. Oh, no. Okay. Which, yeah, I think the answer is no. You let it slip. All right. All right. See everybody next week. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>